Jumbo mingi, jumbo sana. Welcome to yet another episode of Diaspora Connect. We are live from Lukina Fashion House here in Kent, Washington. Now, Diaspora Connect is a podcast produced by One Vibe Africa, and our objective is to demystify the diaspora experience. And today we have a very special guest who, um, who's done so much work from uh, the African continent to the rest of the world. Uh, from his work, uh, Whip Not Child, The River Between, Matigari, Wizard of the Crow, Decolonizing the Mind, Politics of Language in African Literature, I Will Marry When I Want, Whip Not Child. Our guest made it to Obama's list for his favorite read in 2018, uh, The Grain of Wheat. He's been awarded multiple times all around the world, inc including the Lotus Prize for Literature, uh, Nonino International Prize for Literature, the National Book Critics Circle Award, as well as a couple of honorary degrees from the University of Auckland, the University of Dar es Salaam, and the Yale University. He's currently the Distinguished Professor uh, of English and Literature at the University of California, Ivin. Uh, he's a neighbor in my neighborhood back in Kenya, uh, Mogoga, around Limuru area. He's a father uh, of six uh, kids, uh, and he's here with uh, us. Nine. Nine children. Yes. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> 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 Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of times, based on this information, is, you know, we depend on Google, mm. but thanks for the correction. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an honor to have you um, with us today. Uh, thank you for taking your time to be here on the show. Um, uh, it's an honor. Say. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for the welcome. Mm -hmm. And especially in this environment yeah. of this uh, Lukinia Fashion House. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, before we started rolling the cameras, I was uh, sharing with the audience that I had the privilege of doing your book. Uh, I was playing Wayaki in the river between. Oh. Uh, uh. We'll, we'll have a chat <laughs> why uh, Nyabura uh. um, had to, you know, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll have a chat later about that. And all the other <laughs> and okay. Yeah. yeah. That'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we'll just go straight into a uh, few questions. Um, one being, why it is at this time in the world, why it is important for us as Africans to embrace our language and our culture. Um, you've done a lot of your literature work around that, uh, putting emphasis around the importance of this. And I would love you to speak um, about that. Yes, mm -hmm. the language question. Thank you for, for asking that question mm -hmm. because uh, the language question is really central to our sense of being mm -hmm. as African people, as any people for that matter. Uh, and uh, let's look at how we came to be made to feel mm -hmm. negative about our languages. Mm -hmm or even how we came to be made to believe that our languages are the cause of division among us. Can you see even mm -hmm. the very idea that what is our own is enemy <laughs> to us, and what is not ours mm -hmm. is what is a friend to us, or rather what is ours disunites us, what is not ours brings us together. Mm. You know, it's a kind of absurd. Uh, if, when you come to think of it, yeah. But, um, oh, where shall I begin? <laughs> <laughs> English, let's just say with. Okay. In, okay, let me first of a little bit of biography. Mm -hmm. As you know, in 1976, 77, I helped uh, join others in mm -hmm. Kenya mm -hmm. in producing a play in Ikoyo language, my mother tongue. And the reason we did the play in Ekoyo because we were actually going to work in a village, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so you couldn't go into a village and start asking people to learn English so you can do theatre with them. You had to start with the language they spoke, correct? Right. So we produced a play called Our Marry When I Want in English translation, but in Ekoyo Gahika Deda. Yeah. And as you know, everybody knows, 
In November 1977, the play was stopped by the Kenyan government. Mm -hmm. And I, a professor of literature at Nairobi University, was put in a maximum security prison, the biggest prison in Kenya, as you know, commit to maximum security. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when I was there in the committee, I was asking myself, why? Mm. I think this, there's something illogical here. Uh, an African government, a post colonial African government, puts me in a maximum security prison for uh, writing or participating in the writing and production of a play in an African language, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I had written other things in English before. I had done plays in English before, which were critical of the post-colonial condition. Mm -hmm. But I was not, except for once when I was taken to a police station for questioning, I was never put in a uh, maximum, or in a prison for that matter, for doing work in English. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's the illogicality of that, posi of that situation that sat made me think, there's something wrong here. You know, there's something which does not compute, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's when I started looking at the colonial situation. And I came to this conclusion more or less, which later I published in a book called Decolonizing the Mind, okay? Mm -hmm. And it was this, that in all colonial situations, Language has always a factor in the process of colonization. Mm. The colonizer always, in all situations, suppresses the language or the language that was colonized and elevates their own yeah, language. Right. And it's true in all African countries. It's true also in some European countries, like, say, Ireland, for instance. When Ireland was first conquered by the mm -hmm. English, when they tried to settle there, for many years they could not conquer the Irish. They could not conquer the Irish. Then in 1585, a, a well-known English poet called Spencer, he's a contemporary of Shakespeare, mm -hmm. wrote a book called A View of Ireland at the Present Time. And this book quite quick is a conversation between two, uh, an in, a visiting English lord from London mm -hmm. and an English settler in Ireland. And what are they discussing? Why have we not been able to conquer the Irish? Mm -hmm. How can we do it? And they come up with two things. One, names. If we can destroy their naming system, how they name themselves, that would be one way, okay? Mm -hmm. But the other way is language, okay? Mm -hmm. If you can suppress their language and their naming system, they'll soon forget who they are, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the same practice was followed with African people and enslaved African people, okay? Mm -hmm. When African people were brought up from the continent, Part of what they call the process of breaking them down, what they call seasoning or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. was language. I tell you, in the plantation in America and the Caribbean, African languages were banned. And some people called speaking African languages were even hanged. You know, mm -hmm. we can do the same thing. I don't want to give a whole lecture, but you can do the same thing. You can see it in Native American mm -hmm. kids. You can see it in uh, Maori kids in New, Z in New Zealand, you know, in Canada, what they call First Nations. The same pattern. Right. Even Japan, when they conquered Korea in 1910, from 1910 to 1945, the first thing they did was impose, <laughs> ban Korean names, <laughs> and then mm -hmm. impose Japanese language. Okay? Right. right. So it became very important to me. Why is this? Because if you bind people, uh, 
if you can uh, colonize the people's language, you are really also colonize their mind, you know, and the history carried by that language, mm -hmm. and all the knowledge is carried by that language, mm -hmm. and all the history that makes people feel we are a people, mm -hmm. you know, you are alienated from it. Right. And then mentally, you are made to attach yourself, root yourself in mm -hmm. conqueror's language, and therefore, you are more proud of the history carried by that language, right. the culture carried by that, mm. the wild outlook carried by right. that language. Right. No. So my position has been like this, you know. If you know all the languages of the world and you don't know your mother tongue or your first language or the language of your culture, mm -hmm. then that is surely self-enslavement, you know. Uh, Wow. Yeah, and very, very important. This is very important. But if you know your mother tongue or your first language, then add all the languages of the world to it. Mm -hmm. That's empowerment. Okay, you know. So the choice we really have is between empowerment mm -hmm. and self alienation. You know, uh, right. and not how uh, this is the case of African American and Caribbean. Even when the African languages were suppressed and so on, they resisted by think retaining African rhythms of speech, okay, mm -hmm. and add to them English sounds, mm -hmm. you know, or creating new languages, okay, right. to give them sense, you know, mm -hmm. and those languages are the you know what has produced the spirituals, the blues, jazz, hip hop, a whole culture which has impacted with a global reach. Wow. So wherever we are, so people using language, mm -hmm. you know, a sense of, a language that can give them a sense of who we are. Right. Or what the lady poet said, mm -hmm. teach me to be me. Right. The only way of teaching me to be me is through our relationship to our languages as foundation. And then, add any other number of languages you want here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs>